uh, I thought before we're going to um, <coughs> tear down uh, the magnetic f flux sensor that I got from eBay as a day, uh, we should go into some uh, theory and uh, I'm tr we'll try to explain how these devices work and uh, what principles are, are, uh, are being employed inside them. So first of all, what is magnetic uh, flux uh, sensors and how do they work? Uh, magnetic field inside uh, any medium such as uh, air, water, ferromagnetic material or anything else um, can be expressed by this formula. So the B in this case is the magnetic field inside the medium and H is the external magnetic field uh, such as the, the field of uh, magnetic field of Earth in our case uh, which is particularly important in, in this example because we are going to me be measuring the magnetic field of the Earth, uh, magnetic compass. But Earth is, the, is not only uh, and mostly not only a source of magnetic field that these devices are designed to measure. It could be anything else, uh, it could be a car, a big uh, a ship, a submarine, or anything else. Well, why did I mention a submarine here? Because uh, the first examples of uh, magnetic flux sensors are appeared uh, sometime around 1936, uh, according to um, internet, uh, Wikipedia, or some other sources. And uh, during se Second World War, this technology was developed uh, almost to its perfection. Uh, and the main reason why was that these devices allow detection of large bodies of metal such as uh, submarines or submerged submarines uh, at uh, bigger distances. So uh, the first uh, uh, magnetic flux sensors were used to detect uh, submerged submarines for airplanes for example um, so if we see the if you look at this formula what we see is that um, uh, the internal magnetic field is proportional to external magnetic field or it's also called uh, auxiliary magnetic field and uh, the formula states that this internal magnetic field is equal to external magnetic field multiplied by mu. Mu is in this case um, a variable called uh, the material's magnetic permeability. Um, the permeability of free space is a well-known variable. It's uh, the value of it is four p four pi uh, ten ten minus seven Henry uh, uh, by meter. And in order to detect weak magnetic fields, such as one of the Earth's, what we need is we need to find a material which has uh, as high mu as possible. Well, because the permeability of free space and uh, absolute permeability value have such an inconvenient values, uh, so it's a very small variable for pi 10 minus 7, uh, what um, is usually specified for materials is their relative permeability such as relative to the, the permeability of free space and if we look at uh, examples of materials such as a, a ferrite its relative permeability can be from 15 to 700 uh, material uh, a mu metal uh, which is uh, commonly used uh, as a material for uh, RF shielding, for example, can be 80,000 um, and uh, this value can go as high as 1 million. Uh, for example, uh, there are material called uh, med glass, which is an amorphous material. It's, be, it's made by uh, cooling um, uh, a ferromagnetic alloy uh, so fast that it won't. It does not allow uh, any crystals to be formed inside that metal. Well, it comes in the form of uh, uh, long 
very very thin strips uh, which is then uh, coiled into a course like this well we'll talk about this a little bit later <coughs> so once we have a material uh, which once we have a high, a high permeability uh, material like this uh, what how they used inside uh, flux gate sensors is as following so we have a piece uh, for example we have a piece of uh, a ferromagnetic material or uh, saturable uh, soft magnetic material sometimes also called and we if we induce a magnetic field by wrapping it into uh, wrapping it around by uh, piece of wire or we can induce magnetic field inside that material and depending on the external magnetic field when this magnetic field is changes its direction uh, the magnetic material itself and the field inside the material itself will resist the change uh, for some time and how much it resists that change depends on how much of the external magnetic field is applied uh, uh, to the to the material for example well, here's the design uh, taken from uh, one of the patents uh, it's dated back to 1946 or 1950 so uh, two uh, saturable uh, cores uh, high permeability magnetic cores are um, wrapped into uh, a primary winding. Uh, primary winding. This is this is this doesn't have to be a uh, lot of uh, turns. Usually, 20, 50 turns is enough, and uh, it's excited by five kilohertz square wave. Zero to five volts or minus five, five to uh, plus five volts, something like that, and. Um, once the direction of the current in this coil changes the magnetic field inside the core also change changes direction and uh, depending on uh, how much external magnetic force uh, field is applied to, uh, to, the, to this course that change will happen uh, sooner or later Uh, to detect this and this is this is very very small uh, uh, change to detect this kind of change uh, what we have uh, have to do we have to pick up the signal that uh, will be generated after uh, when magnetic field inside one of those cores uh, collapsed after the change of the current direction and primary coil, coil. and uh, because this signal is, is very weak, the secondary um, winding can will require up to uh, 2,000 turns or so on. Uh, still very weak signal is then amplified by uh, an operational amplifier or any kind of other amplifying circuit. Then it's fed into uh, a bandpass filter. And what we have on um, output from this from the circuit is a, um, a series of spikes. Each spike indicates the collapse of magnetic field inside uh, the, the, the magnetic course and the current induced during that collapse is going to, uh, to be detected by uh, the secondary winding and by uh, measuring the distance between these current spikes like this you see this is time we can then determine uh, the 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 strength of the external magnetic field applied to this course. 
Now, in this case, not only the the strength of the external magnetic field important here, also the direction that is applied. So, because if if we align the the magnetic field that is induced by the primary coil uh, inside the the the, the, the ferromagnetic material and the external magnetic field such as the magnetic field of the earth uh, these uh, uh, forces will cancel each other but if we turn it 90 degrees then in that case um, they will be out of alignment and so therefore the the effect of the magnetic external magnetic field uh, on the timing and on the, the the magnetic field which is induced by the current in primary coil inside the ferromagnetic materials will be uh, negligible. So this is how since the, the external magnetic fields, in, in our case uh, the magnetic field of Earth, it does not change with the time, well not, not in real time, not very fast, but anyway uh, then we can consider it to be constant and then so by rotating this uh, sensor relative to the uh, external magnetic field such as magnetic field of earth we can then determine the position of the sensor relative to the uh, the direction of the magnetic field orientation of the magnetic field well, so that means that we need one sensor like this for each axis and usually um, in uh, flux gate uh, compass devices uh, there are two sensors um, that are used to uh, together with each other so that's uh, provide x y uh, to uh, two axis and if you want to measure magnetic fields uh, somewhere outside of uh, like in, for example uh, if you want to to measure magnetic field of earth or another planet in space then in that case uh, three sensors are used together and they arranged in uh, three dimensions So two such robot core design, like the like shown this and this the um, drawing that I have, this is this is one of the ways of uh, designing the the flux gate sensor. Um, it used to be quite common, but uh, lately most of the designs uh, include are built on top of uh, using the the. the ferromagnetic material that's shaped in form of a core like this uh, for example here I see uh, I've, I've, I've drawn uh, a ferromagnetic core uh, which is uh, a toroidal core with a primary winding going around it uh, it's, uh, it's a quite uh, usual uh, examples uh, uh, we have uh, uh, we can find lots of uh, inductors uh, using the same uh, same shape um, because it minimizes the losses. So <clears throat> and so the sensor can in that key in this case will be. Uh, Will consist of uh, will be built out of uh, a toroidal core with primary winding going around it, of say 20 to the uh, um, turns of uh, on around the, the the core, which is then placed inside a, a sensing coil with several thousand of uh, of turns, and in that case it will be it will be placed. It will be can see this going like this so 
so this is this is the, this is how it kind of slides in <clears throat> this is this is one of possible designs and uh, sometimes uh, the, the sensing uh, coil is not very wide and it's uh, you can see uh, designs where the coil is just a uh, square shaped uh, toroidal core uh, coil like this uh, sometimes uh, toroidal core is placed inside a plastic case which is filled with two liquids or, or, or one liquid I'm not really I don't really know what kind of liquid they use but uh, something looks like an oil or um, uh, some heavy machine oil or uh, salted water something like this and so the, the core in uh, is placed in inside a plastic container which floats on the top of the liquid uh, what it gives uh, what it what it what it gives the advantage of this design is that when um, let's say for example a boat or car drives on the surface and it's it's um, changes its position relative to z-axis uh, which also affects the, the, the magnetic field uh, this liquid will, uh, will make sure that uh, the, the magnetic core always stays horizontal or at least uh, horizontal on average because uh, usually uh, the sensor gives the the average of multiple measurements so in that case um, we uh, the sensor will will not be sensitive to variations uh, by z-axis and, and that improves the accuracy of the result because obviously if you if you uh, if, the, if you change the the inclination um, of the compass then your position relative to magnetic fields in z-axis will, will also affect uh, uh, your reading. So here I have example of uh, some of the magnetic cores that can be used for um, uh, flux gate in, in, in flux gate magnetometers uh, and uh, flux gate sensors like this. So I don't remember where I've picked up this uh, this uh, demo set it's a magnetic core kit they used for design uh, it was uh, it's it's made by a rather famous uh, company called uh, magnetics uh, and as you can see they mention here that some of these cores use med, med glass alloys inside which are um, just the brand of the uh, amorphous uh, uh, cores that uh, are used in these kind of applications. Um, super Malloy, as far as I know, is another kind of uh, amorphous material. Uh, unfortunately, the company does not, I, I don't think this it worked for them very well, so unfortunately, the company does not make this kind of uh, course and they don't use this material anymore or at least I wasn't able to find any of the any of the course uh, that um, based on med glass in their on their website so uh, I think this was a, um, a product that never actually uh, uh, went uh, fully live so I assume this is this is this is uh, one of the course that are made of uh, uh, med glass uh, you can see here letters mg 109 uh, my understanding is that um, 109 in that case is is just a number of the of the core uh, the way these cores are built and they covered by a rather thick layer of uh, of paint but um, the way these cores are built are um, they made out of 
uh, aluminum ring uh, which is shaped in form of the the u-shaped ring like this and uh, inside it filled uh, with a strip of uh, amorphous material and give an example of, of, of the amorphous material so for example this is this is the um, here I have a strip very thin flexible uh, a strip of uh, a matte glass uh, amorphous uh, alloy so it essentially goes inside like that and then it fits into that core so since it's painted you can I can't see this maybe at one time or another I'll try to use a metal lace and uh, I clean it up but um, last time I tried to measure the permeability of the matte glass material used in this specific core it didn't turn out to be the most uh, permeable material so uh, there are multiple, uh, there are a number of, of uh, alloys uh, they are all called uh, matte glass because it's a brand name but not all of them have very high permeability uh, properties so uh, as much as I hoped this one to be the the the, the famous uh, alloy, it was it probably isn't the one. Another source of high permeability materials, uh, ferromagnetic materials are uh, security tags that are uh, <coughs> attached to uh, items that sold in uh, many uh, supermarkets or stores to prevent theft so the way they work is that inside the tag uh, I don't have a tag, I mean I, I took the, the tag that I, I found recently I took it apart so inside the tag you can find two strips one of the strips will be the the, 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 the material similar to a matte glass or probably is a matte glass um, <coughs> those tags are made a company called a sensormatic and inside you can find uh, like I said you can two strips um, one of the strips will be the, the amorphous material and um, next to it will be uh, a metal strip uh, made of material that can be easily magnetized or demagnetized because these devices change their properties uh, um, significantly in the presence of external magnetic field when, they, when you magnetize the strip uh, for example if this would be the the, the the magnetizable material this one is is a, is a strip of a matte glass so if you magnetize this material the the properties <coughs> of uh, of the, the amorphous material will change and that can be detected at certain distances uh, it will change the resonant frequency of the circuit uh, through which and then you can see that uh, when you go through uh, security gates in the store so uh, if, the, if, the, if the magnetic strip uh, laying next to the, to the amorphous material is not demagnetized properly then it will uh, be detected by the, the sensor inside the security gate and, and it will trigger the alarm um, these are not used as often as they used to be because almost everyone is uh, switching to uh, RFID but um, uh, these are one of the one of the sources that uh, <clears throat> I found 
uh, for 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 amorphous uh, uh, high permeability uh, permeability materials uh, when I needed them. So this is the device I was talking about. Uh, well, now they come in multiple models, and this one in particular is made by a company called KVH uh, in the USA. And the model is MV103A magnetic flux sensor. It shows the the forward position. Um, let's uh, take it apart and see what's inside. You can see that um, this unit is hermetically sealed, and you see this, the, the the rubber seal around this this body, it's made out of plastic and I believe this one is maybe even a magnesium and for whatever reason it has this nice grey sort of matte paint on it it has two connectors, two separate connectors I believe one is for power supply and other one is is for signal but I could be mistaken as well and uh, as you can see there are two connectors uh, attached inside so let me disconnect this it goes into a rather nice uh, military spec connector uh, like that um, see it's uh, it says 1415 and uh, the brand name is Bendix 9629 and whatever it is, is 14 so I believe this stands for 14 uh, signal and 1 ground that's why it's called 1415 so obviously since this is a magnetic sensor nothing nothing here uh, neither the, the screws nor the body the the box itself is is magnetic so here I have a, a tiny magnet uh, on to, uh, top of a neobidium near magnet on top of, of the nothing is actually I can feel no no you can see the screws that I use uh, they're not magnetic eyes I think they are just uh, stainless steel well they're a little bit a little bit oh, I don't know so since they are um, evenly distributed around the perimeter for them being a little bit magnetic probably not a problem but uh, I'll try to avoid uh, magnetizing anything in case I I need this device to work accurately. So here I have unscrewed the main board of the stand so I can flip it around and show you um, how the sensor looks like. So as you can see this is this is this is the design I was talking about last. That's the the mostly uh, shall I call it classical design. So here we can see uh, two things. First of all um, this this uh, uh, brown a uh, coil. This is this is a pickup coil. I think it's a uh, forty eight gauge, several thousand turns. Um, that's uh, that giveaway that this is this is a pickup coil. Oh, if you can see. Uh, If you can see inside, there there are green coils. It doesn't have that many turns. So it's it's probably about 50 or so turns each, or maybe even more. I'm not sure why they need that many, but uh, you can see this this has been arranged in in a form of. Uh, Across this is Z X Y axis and this is the this is the pickup coil. Um, this is also one of the one of the classic uh, approaches to this is that uh, the the pickup coil and 
the, the, the excitation coil are arranged in the form at 45 degrees to each other maybe that's the that's the trick and it says 1 8 mil I'm not sure what it means um, well you can see I'm not sure if you can see if the camera can focus what's uh, well what's inside there is there is a there is a toroidal coil inside that uh, suspended in some kind of liquid it looks transparent almost like a baby oil and uh, if you flip it upside down it will work as well so I'm not sure if this sensor can be positioned upside down and it will work as well uh, obviously it will mess up the south to north but no it should work because um, if I tilt it if I uh, so if I tilt uh, the board like this you can see that uh, the coil inside uh, maintains its horizontal position which is which is quite important to eliminate the errors caused by uh, the, the z-axis variations so this this holes here this mounting holes are symmetric so it's not it's not really clear which way should it go I think if I if I put it wrong, it will, it will uh, point in the wrong direction. Well, fortunately for me, I have saved the, the high resolution photo of this, so there is a little uh, indentation here on the body of this that shows that this is the right position for the for for this for this board. So let me screw it back on and then we'll, uh, we'll go over the schematics. Okay, so let's take a look uh, closer. Uh, take a closer look at the board. Um, first of all, what I see here is is uh, uh, Texas Instrument linear regulator. Uh, have a, let me pull up the. It's a free terminal a positive regulator LM twenty nine thirty, right here. It's, this is the 8 volt version of it and as you can see so the middle middle pin this package is, should be ground so I can actually identify where is the ground here alright so this pin this is the first pin is the ground let me see if anything else so there's the second pin here and the last pin So another ground. So um, if you probably notice, uh, as, as I, I was uh, showing when I opened the, the box, this this connector right here is not used. Well, what I know uh, for sure is that this uh, particular device is ma made in several versions. And one of the versions are made for uh, uh, recreational uh, boats and uh, marine application, and other ones are made for uh, cars. I may be used in military or some emergency services. Uh, who knows? Um, but uh, so depending, I don't think they they make multiple versions of the board. Well, uh, but this is this is but they use different connections and uh, obviously uh, these applications use different protocols to communicate to outside world. That's why we have um, more connectors than used. I don't because I don't think this is a, this is a test connector, but uh, I may be mistaken. Because you can see right here, there are 
unpopulated uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, uh, 20, 22, 4, Yes, and shows that it, this is this is this uh, probably uh, unpopulated um, JTAG uh, interface to this microcontroller right here. Uh, JTAG is usually 10 pins, but it clearly goes straight into the the microcontroller. Yes, you can see this is. Sure, why? Now, I don't know which microcontroller is this because uh, in order to see that, I need to lift this, uh, this oscillator. It's an 11 megahertz oscillator. Want to do that, but um, uh, we'll see later why this one it's not that important what kind of microcontroller it is because um, it's I found out that there's very little that's been done inside the microcontroller, and so most of the interesting circuit is in this area where um, uh, the signal from a pickup coil is processed. see again where the where the input goes so this um, regulator the left pin is is an input none of them actually connected to the input So the reason why I wasn't able to find the input straight away because it's protected by this diode from um, someone accidentally turning on into reverse polarity. So you can see this is the most right pin. This is this is the input. Uh, this is where we can apply power, and this is the it goes for this diode right here tiny device so here I have it powered up and it's only using about uh, 70 milliamp at 10 volts you can see uh, my power supply here and um, everything is seem to be working because I can see there is a so here we have a, a, the, the sine wave at 11 megahertz what I need to do first is to locate uh, the primary and secondary, the, ex the, the excitation and pickup coils. Um, you can see that this, this uh, the coil assembly, the sensor assembly itself, has six connections. Two connectors for um, uh, the excitation or primary windings connected in series here and here. Uh, they marked as uh, D and R and uh, C and R 
and uh, the C R and R connected to 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 each other. That's why I I said that these uh, two uh, coils connected in series exactly as as I was showing <coughs> earlier uh, in my drawing. So this is this is must be uh, uh, a pickup coil in that case. And in order to to check that, I can uh, check the resistance. So the primary winding should be relatively low resistance since it has fewer windings than than uh, the excitation coil. So this is this is a two hundred. So here I have uh, 200 ohms for this coil and if we measure here I have 12 ohms for this coil so that means I was wrong so these, these are, are um, the primary winding or excitation coil and these are the sensing coil which makes more sense because the, the signal processing circuitry are all located right here and I can see that uh, the signal from the uh, from the, the the pickup coil or sensing coil goes right into this uh, operational Amplify. So the signal from the, the sensing coil from one side goes into input of LF347M operational amplifier, which is the the wide bandwidth quad JFET input operational amplifier, uh, and another side also goes into the same. Um, amplifier but uh, the second instance of it so there are two amplifiers the signal from one side goes into this and signal from this side goes into this amplifier uh, I'm not sure if these are arranged into uh, instrumental uh, op -op, uh schematics but uh, I guess I need to uh, reverse engineer this this uh, this side and to see for sure. So I've hooked up the props from my oscilloscope. Um, one channel to one side and another channel to the second side of uh, my oscilloscope and um, <coughs> this is a primary or excitation winding C and what I, what I, ex what I see is not exactly a square wave it doesn't look like I expected. It's more like a so it's more like a step wave, um, which goes positive and negative. Um, it's pretty much what I was expecting, not exactly. So here's what's going on here: um, the signal from a sensing coil, which starts right here. You can see. This is uh, output D and output C in this case goes into uh, two operational amplifiers. So each end uh, of the sensing coil, one goes into the first operational amplifier, which are um, LF347M, which is the high impedance JFET. Uh, quad JFET input operational amplifier, uh, low input bias current, 50 pico amps, and after that goes the second stage, which is uh, include another component, which are the analog multiplexer demultiplexer, um, and which followed by another multiplexer, the multiplexer, uh, analog multiplexer.
uh, which is 14 or 5 1451B, uh, which is analog multiplexer demultiplexer made by uh, ON uh, semiconductors. And after that, there are another uh, O pump, a precision O pump made by TI. It's a TLC272. So if you look at the signal that <coughs> produced by this circuit, we can see that it, it converts the output of a sensing coil into uh, a timing signal. Um, so you can see. <clears throat> so if so, I set up a trigger here, uh, which is. Uh, what I'm looking for is, 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 is so the signal uh, output for this circuit comes in a big, uh, with big gaps which are not 10 meg, uh, kilohertz uh, they're about uh, let me see what's the what's the sampling rate of this sensor essentially this this uh, this this time interval here is essentially a sampling rate of the of the sensor itself um, and uh, this is the 10 Hertz which is exactly the the sampling rate that's specified uh, for the data sheet that I found uh, earlier uh, for a similar model of uh, flux gate sensor and that matches that uh, that data sheet. So, like I said, I think the the boards inside are all same. It's just a different uh, different protocols are used as an output and you'll see. Uh, <coughs> uh, we look at the protocol that I found uh, on the output of this circuit, which are uh, on a, which I found on pins that are not connected in this specific model, but uh, the ones I was looking for actually. So if we if you look at uh, at at the waveform produced by this uh, signal conditioning circuit, you can see that it uh, it generates one, two, three uh, three pulses on. Uh, on this output here, which actually coincide with, uh, let me see. So this is this is uh, uh, probably a beginning of each. Ah uh, yes, so so. The first first measurement coming here, second one coming starting from this position, Sec third one starts right here, and then another one here. So as you can see, five position my cursor right here and I zoom in a little bit and see a trigger again see every time <coughs> the positions of this pulses they don't really change well that's because I don't move the sensor If I start moving the sensor, rotating it around its axis slowly, like that,
you can see that things start to change. So you can see how this process move when I move the sensor. So since I have the probes attached to, to the device, it's not that convenient for me to move the device. And rather, I can try take a small video magnet that I have around here at the tip of my scribe. And if I position the, the scribe on the left of the sensor, you can see And then I go and I position it on the right. You can see how how the position of the pulses change and it's dramatically changed when I put uh, the magnet in front of the sensor. If I go back so essentially <coughs> That this is the only input from the sensing circuit itself into the microprocessor that I found on this board. What it means is that uh, all information that's required in order to determine the orientation of the sensor in the uh, Earth's magnetic field is encoded in this uh, in this process right here. And uh, well, I can see that the width of the series also changes. See when I move the the sensor left. So so right now I have the magnet on the left. I go to the right in front of the sensor and then behind the sensor as you can see it changes dramatically like that So I've hooked up this um, this pin on a second connector. Um, this this on the second header uh, to my scope, and I found that there's the serial serial protocol present. So this must be the output uh, that I was looking for, and it's my theory is going to be compatible to NMIA 0183. Uh, protocol. Well, <coughs> the interesting thing as well is the fact that this this particular pin is not connected on the on the box, as you can see. This this. The wire is missing, so the pin number four is not connected. Um, that's kind of aligned with the theory that uh, these devices must have been uh, uh, all using same board, but uh, for different markets, they just use different protocols, which is programmable in this uh, microcontroller uh, here. And then there's there is a, a there is a, some kind of uh, output protection you can see here as well uh, along with the the optical isolator uh, made by NEC. So let me see again. 
if I have another ground here somewhere. Yeah, so this 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 pin is the ground. So what I'm gonna do right now, I'm going to take this uh, RS232 uh, to USB adapter uh, made by FTDI and uh, connect it to this to this board and see if I can uh, I get something legible out of it. So according to the pin out of RS32, pin number five goes into ground, which in our in my case will be yellow. You can see a little bit more. I'm going to plug it into this circuit and then here is another ground pin. And pin two, which is uh, received data. going to be red so that may actually work so this is I open so should be safe to connect it anyway, regardless if it's input or output. But so, only thing I need is USB cable. connected my USB cable to my PC I'm going to plug it in and uh, I need to find out which COM port I should look for okay so after some poking around I figured out that uh, <coughs> My problem was that I've, I've chosen the wrong speed for, for this protocol. And the protocol I'm talking about is... Uh, it's NMEA, NMEA 0183 protocol. Uh, as you can see... <coughs> The speed I should have chosen in this case, the, the serial speed, is uh, 4800 bit. Well, yeah, I should have looked at, uh, at the, the, at the, the bit rate on my scope first, and that would have given me the, the, the correct uh, the <coughs> bit rate uh, to start with, but for some reason I as always assume that this is a 9600 uh, 81 uh, configuration and yeah to not to be not here's a screenshot from uh, 
from the data sheet that I found for another similar sensor made by the same company. As you can see here, um, <coughs> colors are of course wrong uh, for, for, the, for the wires inside, uh, inside the, the box, but uh, what you can see is that it's using uh, a protocol called NMIA0183. Well, this protocol is used to connect uh, for interconnection between different uh, uh, sensor uh, in, and devices in uh, uh, navigation devices on uh, recreational boats and big ships and things like that. So, if we look at uh, another example of uh, one of the and me and messages as you can see it's called uh, HDM message or heading magnetic as you can see there here here's the format of that message uh, let's zoom in a bit uh, <clears throat> the message ends with HDM and the first position is heading degrees magnetic uh, letter M indicates that this is a magnetic center uh, sensor and uh, the what follows it is, is a checksum um, as you can verify uh, whether the noise affected uh, uh, the, the output and uh, here is what uh, my sensor is uh, spitting out um, you can see print cells HT, HC, HDM. I don't quite. I don't know what H, HC stands for, but this is this is exactly what uh, the INME protocol says it should be. And the heading in this case is 181.5. It's a quite a. It's very good resolution, and it goes up to 0 0.1. And um, and magnetic and 24 is the checksum checksum changes with, with the value <coughs> so if i start rotating the sensor you can see how heading changes So it was 198, now it's 215, 220, 224, and so on. Well, <clears throat> to show how sensitive this device actually can be, I have to here is a little demonstration. So this is this is the same tiny magnet that I have. Uh, it's it's a strong uh, video magnet at uh, at the tip of a scribe, um, which is a pen uh, for scratching on the metal surface. And if I uh, I'm holding this right now, I'm holding this uh, this magnet. It's a distance of about 70 centimeters to a meter on the left side of a sensor and you can see the heading uh, read out it shows 184.3 so now if I take it and I put it on the on the right side of the sensor you see how it changes it's 185 and believe me I am holding it uh, 70 centimeter, almost a meter away from a sensor. I'm not, I'm not just poking it into a sensor. I'm, I'm holding it a large distance. So 184, and here I have this this magnet uh, behind the sensor. It doesn't affect it, which I would not expect. And then here we go again. It's on the left side of the sensor. No, it isn't affected much. Maybe it's me. Maybe my. So 
four. Okay, so back on the left side. Here's, I'm trying to put it in front of the sensor. I'm not reaching far enough, so it's about 40 centimeters away from the sensor. And then again, behind the sensor. And on the right side, you can see how if I, if I move it around slowly, at closer distance you can see how reading changes so if I rotate the sensor itself I'll be saying story so I'm not really sure what kind of magnets I have laying around so if I put this this magnet away and I start rotating the sensor it's going to change but it's not clear to me right now because it's changing because uh, of of the earth's magnetic field or it's changing because uh, I have some other magnets around oh yeah sure I have here is the screwdriver it's pretty much magnetic and here's another one and if I move these things away you can see Yes, almost everything I have <coughs> around here could be magnetic and uh, well, the here, here we go, there's a tiny near, near video magnet attached to my lamp uh, It's almost impossible to to say <laughs> what I am actually <laughs> what is this compass is actually pointing to? This is how sensitive it is. Well, so I found, so I found uh, the signal that I was looking for. It's definitely a useful device. It can be used and uh, well, I, I, when I bought it, I was planning to do two things with it. First of all, I was thinking maybe I can have a, <clears throat> like maybe I can do some uh, uh, research and find out how really these devices uh, are built. Because I, I was actually planning to build my own, and uh, still, maybe I still will. Uh, I build my own uh, flux gate magnetometer using the components that I have uh, collected so far um, and these sensors although they point to the Earth's magnetic field which is not exactly the, the, the North Pole uh, of our planet and they can be affected by uh, many things such as metal uh, objects around them and so on there are situations when you can't get around um, or there are situations where these sensors are quite helpful and one I can think for is uh, what if I would like to build a submersible robot there are no GPS signal underwater so it could be quite useful 